Uh, so my clock says 9.30, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining Data Con LA 2021. Welcome to the Data Infrastructure and Security Track. My name is Joanna Perdomo, your host, and our co-host today is Aaron Ortea. Together, we'll be moderating the chat and Q&A for you during this session. We have our guest today, Nuri Halperin, and he'll be talking about schema modeling patterns and best practices for MongoDB. Nuri is a software architect, speaker, and author. He helps companies develop scalable systems, websites, and business applications. He's been turning projects into success stories for a variety of clients for over two decades. Nuri is an author of several Pearl site courses. He also is a Microsoft MVP alum, a MongoDB master, and a recipient of MongoDB's William Zola Award for Community Excellence. He enjoys tinkering with Arduinos, 3D printing, and mentoring youth robotics teams. And I won't take any more of his time. I'll hand it over to the speaker. Thanks for being here, Mary. Uh, thank you, Joanna. Uh, so we'll, we'll jump right in. You've introduced me. Um, uh, good morning. I hope you're enjoying the conference so far. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, some patterns and best practices for MongoDB schema modeling. Uh, and it may sound a little weird. Why are we talking about it? So we'll uh, address that as well. Um, why are we talking about um, schema modeling for a document database? So at the core of it, we want to maximize the performance of our workloads. The workloads could be write heavy, read heavy, some mixture of the above. At the end of the day, the database is there to serve you the data and we want to maximize that performance. We want to improve the utility of the data stored in the database, meaning that we want to be able to access it with rich syntax and to have it serve all of our business needs. So it's not just about mechanics of storing, it's also about how easy or how feasible are my access patterns to the data that I store there. And we overall want to reduce the cost, reduce the uh, you know, dollar cost of our infrastructure, the um, cost uh, processing-wise of CPU, RAM you're utilizing in order to enable more throughput, speedier access, and so forth. So driving those design decisions, we have a core um, um, kind of uh, concepts uh, the first one and chief one is the document-oriented nature of MongoDB. And we want to keep that in mind that it is a document database, not a relational database, not a graph database, not a key blob store. It is a document-oriented database. We want to be aware of the mechanics of what, uh, of how exactly MongoDB engine stores the documents, accesses them, and processes them. And knowing these mechanics will enable us to pitch into its strength rather than assume it's doing certain ways like other engines and uh, possibly leave some points on the table. And we want to drive our design decisions by use cases. We do not want to look at optimizing the storage, for example, storage is cheap, is kind of the mantra here. We want to optimize for the use case. So our design decisions should be driven by the use cases, the knowledge it is document oriented, and the understanding of the mechanics. So what is it about document orientism that we want to be aware of? In document-oriented databases, Mongo being a prime example, documents are stored as a bunch of fields with values in one contiguous buffer. So a single document encapsulates all the fields, all of the values in one document. That one document matches, hopefully, your programming paradigm. Namely, if you have a POJO, a POCO, if you're in Java, C, C Sharp, what have you, you will be able to map directly the values from your in-memory object to the document itself. So there's less translation and less manipulation of uh, things in order to represent the data. 
less friction in storing it, less friction in translating it, less mechanics is faster. And it's efficient for access in one shot. And we'll talk more about that. One shot, by the way, does not mean that every query I have has to return exactly one document. It means that if I need to get data, I can rely on a document, two, three, maybe a few, to return everything from one collection in one document. So let's start with a use case driven thinking. We have requirements. We have business requirements that tell us that we want to show a customer. We want to know where they live and we want to know what kind of foods they like. Okay, some theoretical example of a user profile, very common around the interwebs. So we want let, to let these requirements drive our design. With a document oriented approach, it's fairly easy. Documents are flexible. They're, you're allowed to store any number of fields in any uh, nesting level, including groups of things like arrays. So we see uh, the customer here, let's say it has a name, Bob, uh, that's our person. And uh, we have an address for this person because we wanna know where they live and we wanna know what foods they like. So we have an array of foods and if we discover they like more foods, we can add to it and less foods we can remove for it and so forth. But you see that the encapsulation here is that our use case required, the workload said, I wanna have a customer, I wanna know where they live and I wanna know what foods they have. So I store it all together in one document. So the one shot principle is that data that works together lives together. What would be the antithesis to this? Well, in the tabular world, we would have stored many tables in order to represent that data. We may have had a person table because uh, all the properties uh, or the fields for the person would be there. But addresses, there could be many and they could be shared. So we'd probably have a separate table for addresses, separate table for foods, defining what foods are available. And then a relational table, a relating table, interstitial to person and food in order to relate certain food instances that generically are defined to this particular person. So you can see that we take these entities and we think of the person as an entity, the address as an entity, a food as an entity, and we spread them across storage, which means at runtime, some engine will have to go and uh, hunt for these uh, little rows from various tables that are stored potentially on different storage and cobble them together in order to give you a result. So this is the opposite of encapsulating all fields for a single shot. Which brings us to another anti-pattern, which is the flat document anti-pattern. In this anti-pattern, people are remembering relational modeling techniques and spreading the various logical entities they think of into separate collections namely the person into a collection of people with a flat document and flat means that there's pretty much no nested uh, fields and no arrays it's just single um, uh, scalar fields so here the modeling uh, goes the direction of relational modeling and although mongo nowadays has the dollar lookup which allows you to simulate a join Mongo doesn't really like doing joins. It is not what the engine's core strengths are at. And this is not great modeling. It seems reasonable because then you only store an address once, but in terms of performance, this will cost you penalties. So we want to take home from this that we wanna model the scenario, the scenario, right? drives our design decision. The scenario was, I have a customer that has a place they live and foods they like, and I wanna get that. That is the scenario, get that. Well, design a document that fulfills exactly that. And do not uh, separate those into entities. Don't think of these 
the customer as being a separate entity from their own address and the foods that they like. All of this together was the requirement. I need that together for my scenario. So model that directly. Another thing to mention, I talked about join. Mongo also enforces no referential integrity. You may have read somewhere in the docs that there's a that BSON type called dbref. That is nothing but syntactic sugar around uh, wrapping uh, NID and collection name. It has no referential integrity, maintains nothing. So the idea of creating a separate bucket for addresses and somehow relating them by ID, Mongo will not ensure that a person lives in a valid address ID in any way. If somebody deleted an address and you were referring to it, it will just not be found. It's as simple as that. Next, let's move to data types. There are rumors out there that Mongo does JSON. I'm not sure where they come from. Mongo uses BSON under the covers. BSON is the serialization uh, protocol that Mongo uses for storage and for transporting documents over the wire to the client. BSON, unlike JSON, is very strongly typed. It has some 30 odd very uh, different data types and those data types are designed to be compatible precisely with the c representation of the bytes in an application meaning that if you store an int 32 the int 32 won't need to be parsed and processed in order to load into a int 32 variable all it will have to do is read the bytes exactly how they're laid out and that's that so it's very efficient encoding in that sense. The BSON data format um, allows um, a variety of types and we want to use them. If we use them, it means that operators that operate on those data types are able to understand the field and give you more control, more manipulation, more utility. If you have a date stored, for example, you have an operator that says, I can get the dollar month, the month of a date, or the year of the date, or the leap second of a date. So there are operators that do that. But if you don't store the data field in a concise data type, you lose that ability. Or you would have to do on-the-fly conversions for your queries, which is slower. So here are some field anti-patterns. Um, one of them is to store dates as strings. I just mentioned your operators will not be able to pluck out the month from this. Um, if you did a string, I would hope you would do, didn't do this because parsing this and finding the slashes and all of that in Mongo parlance on the server side is fairly expensive. Storing numbers as strings, again, you lose the ability to add, divide, average, things like that. Storing uh, Booleans as strings, you get the pattern storing something as strings and require parsing, no good. Then we have things like encoding full blobs into Mongo. It might be not readily apparent here, but what I'm doing is storing an address as a JSON blob, as a JSON string, instead of storing addresses with subfields that have the values. So that means that I cannot use Mongo's uh, query language and say, what is line one from the address or city? Because it is a blob effectively for it. It's just a string. It doesn't understand fields inside that string. And finally, numeric precision. If you need math precision for financials or whatnot, there is a app for that. It's called um, Number Decimal, and it is capable of uh, storing a much wider, uh, more concise data type. If you used float or something, you will get math rounding errors. In fact, here are the fixes to these anti-patterns. For dates, use dates. Mongo has them for um for uh, uh floating types use double or something some numeric um 
value. If you are using a numeric value, you can use all the math operators on it. For true false, there's a type for that. Use true and false. Mongo has representation, internal representation for that. For seemingly blob for flexible data that might come at you with JSON, parse that and store subfields. With this representation of address, I can say where address.city equals Los Angeles, and I can reach it using query language. And finally, for exact financials, use number decimal, which has the precision uh, that um, that kind of math requires. Moving on, smaller in general is better. So a document is a bunch of fields with values, some of them nested, that's fine. And Mongo actually lets you store up to uh, 16 megabytes in a single document. But just because it lets you do that doesn't mean it's a great idea. In fact, it is a not good idea. The reason smaller is better is because documents and disk have to be read in their entirety to be processed. So understanding the mechanics that a document is just a BSON buffer, and that BSON buffer gets stored on disk, loaded into CPU, queries and things like that, the CPU you know, operators run against certain fields and filter them or project them or return them to the client. But the document in its entirety has to be read into memory. That means that larger documents will require more of your I.O. channel. Even if you use compression, once the document hits memory, it will be decompressed. So now it's it consumed memory for its compressed uh, variation as well as expanded to the full value so that the CPU can access fields, right? So you're consuming memory. And of course, over the wire, if you ship the whole document, then um, the whole size of the document will be need to transmit over the network. And larger means more time, more resources. So if we're looking to be more efficient, make documents smaller in general. How small? Mm, not too small, right? There's also a lower bound where a document of is of no utility if all it had is an ID and two bytes. Um, we do want larger than that. We want a useful document that represents your use case, but we don't want to add too much to it. Keep laser focused on your use case and keep the uh, field count and sizes conservative. So how do we um, kind of comply with this advisory? Um, we can split rarely used fields into a separate document or collection, or we can use aggregation and client size, uh, client side uh, queries to um, reconstitute rarely used fields. An example is we have a document here um, for a resume or something like that. Uh, so this is Bob's resume. He has an address. There's some foods he likes. I don't know why that's on the resume. Maybe he's a chef. Um, and then the resume is composed of a bunch of elements. Each element is a job title. I guess he's not a chef because it's, it's an SRE. <laughs> so each element here is um, is a represents a job, and in the job, there's a job title, and there's a description of the job and exactly what Bob did, and it could be fairly verbose. Well, if I'm going over all people's resumes and just sifting through, do I want to see all their jobs right away? Not sure I do. So in this case, what we could do is trim down the document for a use case of just listing candidates and not having the full gory detail of the description of their jobs into two parts. The top part here represents Bob, the candidate, without too much extra data, kind of a caricature or you know, summary. And the second document will still be with ID of Bob, but we'll have a type here in the underscore T field that says it's a job history type document. 
So I can query at the top here, I can query on the underscore T of mini profile for all candidates in summary to show the summary pages. And then in the case a recruiter or a would-be interested party wants to know more, they could say, I want to see the job history of Bob. And then they will dig into the collection and dig up those particular documents for Bob and display them. So this is a very common pattern. Also happens with uh, product catalogs, uh, where at first shot you show uh, product summaries, a listing, and only when somebody clicks through, which is a more rare occasion, um, you go and dig up the rest of the uh, gory details about the document, about the product. Thinking smaller, thinking fewer, we want to have fewer DBs and fewer collections in general. Does Mongo limit you to the number of databases? Not so much. Or number of collections? No, not so much. But there is a cost to that, which is file handles. And once you have too many file handles open, uh, Linux will limit you on how many open file handles. And you can bump this limit up. But still, it represents a tax on the operating system to manipulate so many file handles. And indeed, there is a cost to it because the uh, Wired Tiger storage engine will have to represent each collection into blocks uh, for that collection particular. So if you have more uh, collections and more databases, there will be more storage block areas that the engine will have to store translates into more open file handles and more file handles in general. So that is more taxing if you can consolidate into fewer databases and fewer collections. So the reasoning here, uh, taxes on the OS, how many resources uh, it needs uh, to track all of these uh, file handles um, and the code smell or not the code smell the uh, monitoring smell of how I know that there are too many databases or collections is that you see that an organization uses one MongoDB for everything um, what you see is either sprawling in many 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 applications using the same infrastructure or an application that tries to do things like multi-tenantism multi or uh, address other multitudes in their application by apportioning a logical database for every uh, group or every customer or something like that. And once this grows beyond a few tens or a few hundreds into the thousands and tens of thousands, you start seeing things slow down. Another thing about fewer things is um using too many fields you see documents that maybe are not so large in a megabyte size uh in a in a uh, byte size but have very very uh, uh many fields in there and the thing there to realize is that it's unlikely for a human to consume so many fields interact with them at once which means what it means we're not driven by the use case scenario you know, if a catalog item had, you know, 10, 15, 20 fields and we displayed all of them on the screen, sure, on the screen, sure, yeah, that's valid, right? That's the use case of the product detail. But if it had 1,000 or 2,000 or 10,000, how is that even going to display on screen? How is it used? So we want to start asking those questions and say, what is the use case scenario that necessitates so many fields living together? How do they work together? What's the relationship between the field? Are there groupings we can identify and further separate the document? Because it's likely too complicated. So the smell uh, for this is documents that just have uh, huge documents and where they uh, you identify fields that are rarely used or not used by the main use case scenario. In the same spirit, we want to move to shorter arrays. Shorter arrays are for two reasons. One is that 
at some point, if you tend to store many elements in arrays, you might blow the size of the document, meaning beyond the limit that Mongo allows. But even if you didn't reach that, there's a good operational reason, which is once you have replica sets, um, Mongo has to store the picture, the full um, array picture under certain manipulation operators like add to set. So what happens is that your op log will fill up with documents with very large arrays. So it will shorten the time window that your op log may contain. If you have ample disk space and not too much activity, that might be fine. But under um, higher uh, performance requirements and busier systems, this can be taxing. And again, writing to an op log, uh, it's a collection. It's stored on disk. So we're writing larger documents, which negates our previous advisory, use smaller documents. We want to generally fit the workload in memory. Mongo has uh, no uh, physical construct called the working set. The working set is a logical definition that says that um, a certain uh, the all of the data that is required for an operation uh, is the working set. When the working set fits in memory, Mongo uh, operates quicker because access to the information is uh, is quicker uh, because accessing I/O is relatively slower. Can Mongo work fine when uh, things don't work in a, in it don't fit in memory? Sure, it can, but it will be slower if it has the page to disk and load uh, parts and, uh, into memory. When things don't fit into memory, it will be more I.O. paging in uh, pages from uh, memory, from disk to memory, and so forth. So the working set, what is it? It's the sum total. It's a definition that just says the sum total of the result set, what will be returned to the client, the, doc num the size of all of the documents loaded to process your operation, and the indexes. I say docs loaded, you may think, hey, query, why don't you say query? Well, also when you're doing updates, if you're updating a thousand documents, each document will be uh, loaded into memory before they're written back. So um, for sure, this is the documents loaded and not just query. It applies to reads and writes. So this is a working set, a general concept. If you had all of this in memory, you didn't have to go to disk, as simple as that. Now, how big is your working set? You will have to employ monitoring. Um, if you're using MongoDB Atlas, you will have graphs readily available. Same if you had um, um, Ops Manager or Cloud Manager or MMS, if you're really, really operating old clusters. Uh, there are also tools like MongoStats and things like that. And if you're using your you know, um, uh, Prometheus, um, uh, or any other, you know, third-party monitoring, open source monitoring, there's probably a plugin for Mongo. You can do this. If not, you can hop into a shell and issue a, a DB stat, a collection stats, things like that. Start investigating uh, what the size of collections and indexes are. Uh, but for how many bytes read and written to disk and over the network, you will want to use monitoring. And how do we fix the working set, quote unquote fix? Well, we obviously can buy more memory, uh, but at some point we'll run out of headroom and it's expensive. So the last thing, uh, the last item on the list here is if you have a sharded cluster, add another uh, shard. Another shard will reduce the workload that any, partic any single shard uh, works because it distributes the data. So that's a way to get around workloads not fitting in memory. Um, primarily, you want to filter and use indexing to reduce the amount of work that Mongo has to do in processing your workload. So indexing lets it avoid full collection scans. If you have collection scans, you will probably blow your working set. And then finally, you want to project selected fields. You want to return to the client the minimum necessary for them. So queries that return data should specify which fields exactly they're interested in. 
because even if the document was loaded into memory, it doesn't mean the client needs all of it. So just project out the fields they need, kind of like select field one, field two, and just take the things you need instead of cramming over the network the whole document or documents. Simpler is also better. We want to keep documents simple. And the reason we want to keep documents simple is limitations around indexing as well as the necessity to unwind them in order to address them with operator. On the bottom left, we're seeing an aggregation query. And because our document here on the right has embedded arrays within arrays, we have to unwind twice in order to get to a certain uh, project inside a, um, inside a job experience. So it's just more processing. More complex is more work. Now, I'm not saying don't embed fields. By all means, do uh, when it makes sense. But try to avoid very complicated documents when you need manipulation at the data ser at the server level into individual fields. When you just need to read the whole thing, uh, that should be fine. And last one here, uh, bucketing. Uh, we want to talk about um, time series. I said uh, smaller is better, but as it turns out for certain workloads, especially time series, um, logging every uh, measurement into a single document with a time uh, is not a great uh, thing for I.O. What it tends to do is to uh, require many more fields uh, in the indexes on um, memory, many more entries into the uh, indexes that index that workload. Uh, and overall, you'll have to dig up many more documents. So there's a certain amount of work in I.O. Uh, of these block of these items spanning multiple blocks because they're very tiny. So this would have been our remedy um, uh, structurally how we would have designed um, time series. We'd create a bucket. Let's say for uh, September first, we would have a bunch of readings starting from uh, midnight all the way to twenty four hours or twenty three hours. Um, or we'd have a bucket for every six hours or one hour, depending on how often you log measurements. And then in the readings array here, we would have a measurement coming at the cadence. And here I have a demonstration saying, well, there's one every hour. OK, so what's going to happen here is for this 24 hours, all the readings are going to go into this one document. And because of that, if I needed to load 30 days worth of measurements, I would be loading 30 documents. Whereas if not, I would be loading 24 times 30, which is way more documents. So the indexes are going to be smaller when you're using bucketing uh, and access will be more efficient. At the bottom, you see a couple of fields with, uh, with totals here, uh, the total count and the sum of these temperatures, which allows me to do quick average calculations too. So this is another pattern of aggregate and write, but um, I won't get into it because of time constraints today. So this is uh, it for bucketing uh, demonstration. Uh, the bucketing advantage is uh, reduces document counts, index, and so forth, as I mentioned. And finally, indexing, uh, we want to index uh, our workloads. We want to inspect our uh, fields, make sure they are of the right data type. Therefore, I'm going to be able to use more concise and better indexes for this data type. We want to leverage collation uh, for case insensitive matches. That's one of the uh, bigger hogs of, uh, of resources when people resort to using regular expressions expressions with uh, ignore case only uh, for the benefit of doing case insensitive comparisons. Uh, when you leverage collation, you do not need to use regex. You can do straight equality of case insensitive. And finally, better indexes, uh, better index types for your exact workload, like using geo index instead of trying to do client size radius calculations and so forth. 
In order to inform all of this, we would need monitoring of some sorts uh, at, at from the Mongo shell or from any you know access from a client. You can issue a command to get statistics, collection level, database level, or cluster level. So you can view those directly. You can use uh, monitoring available from various tools from Mongo or third parties. And you want to use them all the time in production as your application matures, things will change. The number of items will change. The query plans will change. So this is something that is part of living with a database. It's not something you do once and then go away for a year. This is something you want to continuously monitor and continuously improve and experiment with better indexing, uh, tuning workloads and queries and so forth. So this is kind of our time here. Um, thank you for attending my talk. I'll take uh, questions, time remaining. Thank you, Nuri, for your presentation. Uh, it looks like there's one question in the Q&A, uh, and it says, are there some common misconceptions that people have that are just starting out with MongoDB? Um, well, there's a misconception about uh, JSON that I mentioned, uh, and I see that a lot. There's also a misconception, not a misconception, but a tendency to use ORMs uh, or ODMs, uh, object data mappers, which are the equivalent, not equivalent, but they're kind of the, the parallel to uh, object relational mappers. Uh, so that those would be Mongoose or Morphia or things like that, which try to abstract away the database from you. And it's not a misconception, but it comes with costs. Uh, some of them logical uh, problems and some of them performance. Uh, and I find it better to go directly to the database using the driver and directly shooting Mongo commands at Mongo rather than trying to wrap it in all kinds of repo patterns or all kinds of uh, you know, spring boot or things like that. It's just not necessary to over wrap it. And when you do so, you leave performance points on the table and sometimes uh, that could be very significant. Oh, and Mongo is web scale <laughs> for those of us. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have any recommended resources for folks to check out? I know you're, you have some courses if you have a favorite. Yeah, I sure would love for people to watch my courses on Pluralsight. I have uh, several courses on MongoDB. Um, there's also MongoDB University where they have their own video courses you can attend. And um, if you follow me or my, uh, my website, you can uh, see where I'm speaking next and some of my past uh, talks and conferences, uh, local user groups and everything are recorded and you might be able to find those. Do you have a favorite course of yours that folks should check out? Um, for some reason, I really <laughs> like the Mongo basics. I think the, the first steps in are really the biggest eye openers and I really enjoy giving that talk. I've given it for 11 years and you'd think, oh, well, Mongo basics, we passed that. But every day there's somebody new who hasn't seen it yet and is eager to learn. So I really enjoy doing those sessions. Um, but, uh, but yeah, otherwise I think next to that is aggregation because that's where you get to work your brain a lot and figure out how to how to create a query to exactly calculate different things. And sometimes it could be challenging. It's like, like, oh, the people who did this, but didn't do that, but also are included and in chop it up by days. It's like, I have to kind of arrange pipelines to, to produce the result. And that's kind of, kind of like puzzles and brain teasers. So I like doing that. Yeah. Well, thank you once again, Nuri. Uh, we've come to the end of our session. Thank you to all of the attendees for your questions and be sure to leave feedback. We'll be dropping a link in the chat uh, to that you can provide any feedback. We're always looking to, to improve at, at Datacon and enjoy the rest of the conference today. Thank you all again for attending.